All right, we're going to get started. If you guys, when you're walking in, didn't grab one of the handouts, I encourage you to grab one of those um, so you can follow along. If you are a couple of our family, you should only need one of those. Uh, but if you didn't grab one of those, it's on the music stand right by the door there. Um, so you can pick one of those up. Um, as we're getting started, um, Pastor Tom's going to open us, um, but just reading a little bit from the Word and, and just praying to kick off this meeting. Good evening, everybody. Let's see. I had a bookmark here. Uh, I'm going to be reading from Psalm 127. And, uh, you know, before I read, um, I just got back from uh, a uh, conference, the uh, Founders uh, Conference down in Florida. And, uh, you know, one of the... uh, quotes that I read this, this afternoon out of my notes was that, uh, you know, I, I know we have a bunch of godly people in the school system, but, you know, it's the institution itself that, that's working against us. And uh, Paul Washer said that, um, oh, God, how did that go? I just mentioned it to Pastor Ryan. Um, We're sending our kids to a religious. Oh yeah, our, you know we we send our kids to a religious institution that hate our God. You know, and and you know this doesn't. You know, I I I, I just hope that those that are our are, are teachers don't get offended by that, but. It's the institution, it's not the individual. We pray for the the teachers. We pray for our godly teachers so that, because they do make an impact on people's lives. Just as we, as individuals, as we spend time with people, we have an impact on people's lives. But it's the institution itself, you know, especially coming down from the the state level and 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 the federal level, you know, they hate God. They hate our God. And, uh, you know, we try and raise our kids up to be lovers of God. And then we send them to an institution that teaches them directly opposite. So it's our prayer that, that, that God will use uh, small institutions like this to make a difference in the lives of kids and that we will have an alternative um, for for our kids. So let me go ahead and read uh, Psalms 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It is vain to rise up early and to retire late and eat the bread of painful labor. For he gives to his beloved even in their sleep. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we are just so grateful that God, that that you put desires in the hearts of people to to give alternatives. We just uh, thank you for the the ability to to have a facility that we own nothing on, that has the ability to be able to offer something in a way that, that others could benefit. So Father, we we ask, God, we know that a mind of a man plans his way, but the Lord directs his path. And Father, we know that it's vain to go to rise up early and go to bed to late because you provide for your people, even in their sleep. And Father, we know that, that God, if this should be, that you will do a mighty work 
And we just look for you to do a mighty work. Father, we, we just uh, ask that you just would encourage our hearts, that God, our, our hearts would be encouraged by the things that you have told us from your word, things that you have told us to go out and conquer. And God, you, you've told us to raise our kids in a way that God, that, that according to your statutes, that they would not leave them. Father, we ask that uh, you would be anointing this work and that you, God, would be glorified as a result because ultimately everything, even our lives, <coughs> are ultimately here for your glorification. So, Father, we ask that you would do that. We ask that you just uh, would bring encouragement through this and that, God, that as uh, Pastor Ryan lays out the vision, that, God, that we would catch that vision and that, God, that vision would be to raise up godly men and women who will make an impact in this community and in this world for you. So, God, we just commit this evening to you and just thank you that we are together and that you have brought us here and that, God, we want to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Well, thank you, brother. Um, as we kind of kick off um, and going through some of this, really, I, I want you guys to know our, our heart is to seek to be faithful and really just to trust the ends to the Lord. One of the things that's so amazing about believing in God's providence as we name um, our church after that is it really frees you up to have godly ambition um, because you can leave the results of everything in the Lord's hands. You feel the boldness to pursue what God tells you to pursue. And if it's successful, he gets all the glory. And if it doesn't work out, you say, well, that was his plan. <laughs> and then you continue to go with what the things he's called you to do. And really our heart with this vision night is just to share the things and the desires and the plans that we we feel the Lord has laid on our heart the direction we want to go. And then really just ask that the church would come behind joining us and praying, if that's the Lord's will, that he would bless it. And if it's not the Lord's will, that he would shut it down. And we can sleep comfortably knowing that we are trying to be faithful to what God has called us to do. So if you have your handouts, I am going to work just straight through these tonight as kind of our outline um, over what we're seeking to discuss. And to begin, I think it's helpful to just ask the question of why a Christian academy? Why are we endeavoring to do this at all? And Pastor Tom really already opened with part of this, and that is our desire to raise children um, specifically in the Lord. And as we're called to do that in Ephesians 6, 4, that parents are called to raise their children in the nurture and admonition or of the Lord. And the specific way in which they're instructed to do that, that nurture and admonition, as it's translated, is the paideia and the neuthasia of the Lord. And the word paideia, we mentioned this when we were going through the book of Ephesians, is a particularly fascinating word as it pertains to what parents' duty is as they're raising their kids in the Lord. Paideia was a Greek word that referred to the rearing and education of an ideal member of the Greek state or polis. To raise a child in the Paideia meant to raise well-rounded citizen, refined in intellect, morals, and even physicality. It involved practical subject-based schooling, as well as a focus on the socialization of individuals within the state. It was not merely um, concerned with learning information, but really rather the full development of a child into that uh, person of the polis that they were trying to cultivate. And the Apostle Paul knew this, that, was, that word carried with it all these concepts and ideas. It wasn't just an arbitrary word in their dictionary. The paideia was this whole system of thought and training and philosophy in the Greek culture. And as he's instructing parents on their job and raising kids, he said, you need to raise your children in the Christian paideia. The paideia specifically of the Lord, not like the Greeks do it, but specifically um, related to the kingdom of God. And so we believe for Christian parents to apply this truth, they must not relegate their child's discipleship to just be one component of their upbringing. In other words, we'll teach our kids sports, and we'll teach our kids math, and we'll teach our kids science, and then we'll teach them how to be a Christian, right? And just relegate it into like one component of their upbringing. Rather, the idea is that what he's trying to get at 
is the overarching sense of everything that's building this child up, everything that this child is being discipled in, is in the Lord. It's not a segregated sort of thing where we insert it as, oh, well, we go to school and we also go to Sunday school. It's a sense of all of the education is pointing them towards the end of what Christ had created them to be. And right now, as parents are seeking to raise their children in the paideia, to give them a distinctly Christian education, there really is two main lanes in which Christians um, have ran in if they want to give their kids a schooling, an education that is entirely focused on Christ. And that is typically homeschooling or even private Christian schools have been the two main options. And those options for many families work wonderfully well. And our job is not to critique those. Our job is not to persuade people otherwise. If those are working for families, we want to encourage them and support them in that. But one of our burdens, as we've just had a heart for seeing our families in our church raise their children in the Lord, is those two models are a struggle for a lot of families. For homeschooling, many families, either providentially, just with the situation that God has given them in their family, um, are not able to do it. Um, an example for this, let's say, if there was a mom who's, the husband passed away, right, and she had to go to work, well, what is she going to do then with her children? That wouldn't work out anymore. Other families, uh, by necessity, need to be two-income households, or there's one spouse that's not supportive of the mom staying home and doing this, and the mom wants to give the kids a Christian education, but is unable to for those reasons. So for those, um, homeschooling doesn't always work out. And additionally, um, many women, if they're honest, just don't feel gifted um, in, in order to give their kids homeschooling. I think some moms are really good at it, and others, if they're honest, struggle with it, particularly as they have more children. Some rise to that occasion and others um, really do find that to be a challenge. The other option is um, Christian schools, to send your kids to Christian schools, which again is a great option. And part of what led to some of this is us even pursuing what would it look like for us to help build a Christian school. And one of the problems is with a lot of Christian schools and the way they're designed is they're just incredibly expensive. So the average private school, we're going to get into this a little bit later, uh, but the average private school in the state of Kansas right now, the tuition per year is over $8,000 per child. And we're here as a church encouraging families to have lots of kids, encouraging them to have traditional, this is going to drive me crazy, but encouraging them, <laughs> I'm just going to kill it. Is it a battery? I don't know. It's not battery. It's just kind of, I can talk loud. But we're, we're encouraging them to have lots of kids, to have traditional families, and then to say, and then you need to spend $8,000 a year to send them to private school, even if you have lots of children. A lot of families, even if they thought that private school was great, and they looked at it, and they loved the program, and they loved the teachers, and they loved everything they're offering, their honest assessment would just be, that's great for someone else, but we will never be able to afford that, right? And it's just the cost barrier to the private school system keeps a lot of kids away from it. And we shouldn't begrudge that. Some people can afford it. They, it's a great way to bless their family. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but it's just the reality that a lot of Christian families simply are unable to afford that. And so our goal is not to tear down either of those models but simply having a burden to create a way for parents to educate their children that builds on some of the strengths of both of those models, uh, but also provides opportunity for those families that that model isn't working best for or isn't um, their ideal option. So that's part of our heart behind why we wanted to start a Christian academy and specifically how we're trying to structure um, the one in which we are trying to structure, which leads to the second page, and if you're looking at this handout or looking at the screen behind me, or maybe you've seen the ax and some of the um, stuff we put out so far and you're wondering what is going on with this ax and who is Boniface, which leads to why our desire is to name this academy that we desire to build Boniface Christian Academy. So I'm just gonna read this um, story for you guys that I typed out. Um, it's really a fascinating story and a great namesake for some of the things that we're trying to do here. So a little over 1,300 years ago, a battle was brewing in what we now know as Germany between the missionary efforts of the Anglo-Saxon Christian Church and the Germanic pagans living in the Frankish Empire. On one side stood St. Boniface, a Benedictine monk 
along with his band of Christian brothers. On the other side stood the pagan worshipers of the old Norse gods, brutal men committing human sacrifices and all kinds of barbaric violence. In the middle of this battle stood a mighty tree, the Thor's oak, which is also called the Donner's oak. This tree was a symbol and object of their pagan worship, and they believed that if anyone were to even break a branch off of it, Thor himself would instantly strike them dead with a bolt of lightning. In the spirit of Elijah before the prophets of Baal, Boniface boldly grabbed an axe and declared his intention to fell the tree in Christ's name. The Germanic crowd gathered around the tree, mocking him, thinking surely he was about to be destroyed. But full of faith, Boniface began to swing his axe violently against the base of the great tree. Legend has it that after cutting only one small notch, a great wind arose out of nowhere and knocked the sacred tree to the ground. Seeing that Boniface was left unscathed, many onlookers converted to the Christian faith that very day. Fittingly, Boniface then took the wood from the fallen Thor's oak and used it to build a chapel in which these newly converted Germanic men and women began worshiping the one true and living God. Our prayer is that as students come to be formed in this school, we will help them to sharpen their axes, to wield for the sake of Christ's kingdom and glory, to raise a bold and courageous heralds of the gospel who are thoroughly prepared to chop down the idols of our age and construct a great cathedral from the ruins. The namesake and legacy of Boniface serve as a powerful illustration of the vision we have for our students and what they will accomplish as they're sent out into the world. And so if you're wondering what's up with this ax and who is Boniface, that's who he is. And I really can't think of a better name for what we're trying to accomplish as an academy. We want to raise up bold Christians who love the Lord and are unafraid of the cultural onslaught that will certainly be coming against them and have them be prepared to go out into the world as bold and courageous Christians. And that name and that story, I think, beautifully captures what Um, we are trying to do and that is a true story from christian history it's a great legacy of faith that we have with boniface and with that as well it's not just what he did in chopping down that tree but then using that idol that was chopped down in order to build up um, a chapel for those newly converted people to worship in is a beautiful picture as the text that pastor tom read for us we believe that our children are like arrows in the hands of a warrior That means that our goal, living in the day in which we live, is not merely just to shelter our children from a world around them that seeks to corrupt them, which is true. That is something that we do need to take very seriously as parents. But our desire is to raise them up in such a way that those arrows can actually be sent out and used by the Lord in battle. This is not merely a sheltering a mission. This is a mission to raise up children who will boldly serve Christ's kingdom and do so courageously. And so what will this look like? If you flip to the next page, there's really three aspects that will be the key kind of founding marks of this academy that we're seeking to build. The first is that it will be church run. The second is that it will be lordship focused. And the third is they'll be curriculum driven and teacher facilitated. So the first aspect of this is this will be church run. Now, the majority of Christian schools or academies that exist out there, um, you might be surprised to know, are largely not church run. The vast majority of them function as parachurch ministries, usually with private boards. They're a private 501c3 that receives funding from outside sources to build it up in order to run it. Um, Our desire instead is to run this as a ministry of our local church. And we want to do that for a few key reasons. The first of which is it ensures pastoral oversight of the education and operation of the school. Often with Christian schools, and you understand how this happens, is when it is functioning as a parachurch ministry outside of a local church, there's this institutional desire always to grow the institution, right? We're naturally wired that way. And so what typically happens is, when it pertains to theology and the teaching of scripture, they're gonna want to lower the bar to the lowest common denominator in order to welcome in as many people as possible, right? So you're from all these different denominations, you have all these different beliefs, but we're all under that banner Christian, so come on in, even if you're Catholic, even uh, sometimes if you're Mormon or Jehovah's Witness, if you'll pay tuition, come on in, we'd be glad to have you. 
Um, and maybe they'll have a Protestant confession of faith. Maybe it'll be that particularized. But I've even seen a number of schools here in the area um, that are, are, would say they're a Protestant um, school that have Catholic teachers on staff, for example. And it's a, it's a pretty normal thing in these institutions. It's partially, I think, just how they're governed, how they're structured. Because there's no particular body who's overseeing what the theology of the, ch the school would be. Well, when it's run out of the local church, that's really easy. What theology would this school be promoting? The church's statement of faith. Who would be overseeing that? The pastors. How would we particularly train these children as it pertains to theology? We'd use the catechism that we're encouraging our fa families to use. It's just straightforward because it's run from the local church. Additionally, rather than trying to build a new institution, um, we're simply seeking to use our resources that we already have as a local church um, and as a community for God's glory. So one of the things that is part of behind this desire as well is just thinking through how we can be good stewards of this building that God has given us. Right now in, in our church, the way it's configured, we have 14 classrooms spread out around the building. Right now, two of those classrooms are in use. So we have 14 classrooms designed for education. That's why they were built. That's why they were put in. That's why they were wired. That's why people gave of their tithe checks and gave above and beyond in order to build this facility, to have these classrooms, to serve the kingdom of Christ. And right now we're using two of 14 of those to educate children. That, that's been weighing on me ever since I've been here for the last two years is how do we use these for kingdom ministry? God has given it to us. What would it look like to put those into use? Well, Lord willing, this would be a way for us to redeem a lot of this building that God has given us for God's glory. So first aspect of it, it would be church run. Now in saying that, that doesn't mean that we wouldn't allow necessarily non-member families to participate. We'll get into that a little bit more. But it would be a ministry of our local church. It would be signed particularly for the members of our church, and then in as much as we're able to serve the broader community with it, we would desire to do that. But first and foremost, it would be a ministry of our church. Second aspect of this is it would be lordship focused. Now I'm going to read this and then elaborate on it a little bit. It says it is crucial that the entirety of what this school does be focused on Jesus's lordship over all things. All subjects and coursework must be connected to the reign of Jesus and the response of his people. We refuse to offer largely secular courses with a Christian veneer. Rather, all subjects will be taught distinctively Christian with no neutrality. Additionally, our emphasis is primarily on raising God-honoring Christians, not merely excellent students. Okay, so two components of this. I want to highlight, and this is something I think particularly in the Christian school movement um, that's very common, but often it's very common even in, in the homeschool movement, um, and that is often the, one of the main drivers behind getting kids out of public school and into private school or into homeschooling is fear for what's going on out there, right? So there's things happening in the schools that we don't like, there's influences we don't like, so we're going to get them away from that. And that becomes the primary engine that drives the rest of the education. And to that, I would say, yes and amen. That's the right place to start, right? It's good impulse to see something wrong and to want to protect your children from it. But the positive vision of what we're actually trying to instill is not just to keep our kids from bad things. We want to instill in them all of the right things, right? It's not merely don't learn this bad thing. But let's learn this right thing. And we believe that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords and is at the right hand of the Father and is ruling and reigning and that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him and that we are to train up our children as disciples in all things. So why does math work? Because we have an orderly God, right? We have a God who created order. We have a God who's consistent and does not change, right? That's why math works. How do we understand science? We understand the God who created heaven and earth and gave it its purpose and its meaning, right? All things we want to instruct from a biblical worldview, understanding that Christ is king. And so often what happens is basically almost all of the education, 90% of it plus, will be nearly identical to a secular education. But then they'll throw in a Bible hour or they'll say, oh, we have chapel once a week. 
right? And so they have an aspect of Christianity in the schooling, but it's not the overarching Christianity that drives everything in the school. And so we would want to be very focused on looking to Christ's lordship for every aspect of the school. And then finally, what would be distinct about this academy is they'd be curriculum driven and teacher facilitated. So our vision is to set up this school in the spirit of a one room schoolhouse. Students will be supplied with their own classical Christian curriculum and teachers will help direct them through their studies. The full age range of students learning together, much like a homeschooling setup, but in a community environment. The teachers will thus largely be parents who are helping students stay on track throughout the day and providing particular instruction and oversight as necessary. So it, this is a unique model that we're seeking to endeavor to fulfill. And basically, the best way I know how to describe it is what would it look like if five or six families partnered together and in homeschooling, in a community, in a group, and were able to bring in families who weren't necessarily able to homeschool and help bear the burdens of one another and raising one another's children in the Lord in these things. So when you think of this academy, don't think of there's a kindergarten class, there's a first grade class, there's a second grade class, there's a third grade class. That's not how it's intended to be set up, but rather taking the whole group of students who each have their particular curriculum and helping bring them up as they're able in those various curriculum. There'd be a lot of self-paced learning. There'd be a lot of self-directed learning. And the parents who are helping teach and facilitate in this are helping guide those students along. Now, we phrase this in the spirit of a one-room schoolhouse because it doesn't necessarily mean all kids are all gonna be in one classroom all the time. But what we're trying to communicate in that is that there will be the age ranges learning together. So if brothers and sisters are in this school together, they're going to be in school together. They're going to be learning together. It's not just that they're gonna be dropped off at the front door at the same time. There's gonna be a lot of education that works together. And for larger homeschool families, they know this and they've figured this out in some ways and that there's some things that they learn even with age gaps all together. So say they're going through a history course and they're going through all that same history as a big group and go in different seasons through that in different years. And so all the ages are learning that same bit of history at the same time. But then there's particular things like where they're at in math or where they're at in their reading or writing um, that they need to be where they are, right? And needs to be focused on what their age and what their progress is on that. The goal for this would be help facilitate this. And in this, we think that would be a real blessing even for some of our larger homeschool families or maybe people that have a desire to homeschool but don't necessarily know how to do it and are overwhelmed by it. We'd say, hey, come in, and why don't you be in charge of helping with the English and literature? And they can focus on that and help the kids through that and not have to take eight kids through every single subject every day, but maybe help the 15, 20 kids are there through their English and literature. And they do that. Or there's a parent maybe that's gifted in art and comes in twice a week to teach the kids an art class. And that's what they're good at. That's what they can contribute working together with the gifts within the body in order to serve um, the children and their various needs through their education would be the idea. So flip in the page, we're again near the end here. I wanna lay this out as much as possible and then we'll open it up for questions. How in the world are we gonna pull this off and not just have this be a pipe dream? Three crucial components to the school's success. The first and primary and really only one um, on this list, we'll talk about two others, but this is the one that actually means anything, and that's the Lord's blessing. Ultimately, this will only be accomplished if the Lord chooses to bless it. And the way we're designing this is so scrappy and so dependent on volunteers and so dependent on funding being provided that it will absolutely fail if God does not bless it. There's sometimes you can manipulate the scheme to make it profitable and kind of force something through and jam it and make it happen even if you're hitting a million roadblocks. This academy will not be that. If God doesn't bless it, it's just not gonna happen. And again, this is going back to how I opened this talk of we are freed up to have godly ambition, trusting in God's providence. If this is his will, he's going to provide for it. If it's not his will, he's not. We can go to sleep good with that. This is why we want to open with Psalm 127.1. And I, I don't think it's wrong to read into this verse. Schoolhouse, 
Unless the Lord builds the schoolhouse, those who build it labor in vain, right? If it's not God's will, it's not going to happen. So with that being said, the Lord's blessing is first, is primary, and we're comfortable with that. That if God doesn't choose to allow this to happen, then we're going to keep trucking, doing what he's called us to do. The second aspect that's going to be crucial to the school's success is extreme parental buy-in. Our model will not work unless parents have significant involvement and personal investment in the school. Parents just want a school where, hey, I can pay my fee, I can drop my kids off, you deal with them, I'll pick them up later, I wrote the check, I did my duty. This isn't the school for them. And there are schools that are better suited for that sort of thing. They're going to be those roughly $8,000 a year type schools. That's, that's how partially they do it, is they pay people to do all those things. We're not doing that. We don't have a payroll. And so in order for that to work, parents need to chip in. They need to serve where they're gifted, where they're able. For some, that will look like them giving their time to teach in the classrooms. For others, that'll be helping with administration, planning, maintenance, cleaning, whatever they're gifted in, running fundraisers, doing media, helping prep supplies, all the sorts of things that need to happen in order for it to be pulled off. Parents are going to have to do that. They're going to have to serve. So not all parents will be teachers, but all families who are involved in this must commit to having substantial skin in the game that extends far beyond writing a tuition check. And so as we're doing family interviews for this academy, that's going to be a crucial component of it. How are you going to be serving in this? How are you going to be involved? And if someone really does not want to be involved in the process, we're going to say, we're going to pray for you. I hope you find a great place for your kids. This just isn't the right place for you. And that's okay. Not every place is the right place for everyone. Uh, but for those who are interested in this, the parents are going to have to have substantial buy-in in the process. The third part of this is church member support. In order for this to be a fruitful endeavor, the members of this church will need to be supportive and involved. Now, I think this is a crucial line. It's written here, uh, but I just want to reiterate this. Not all members will have children who are involved in this. Other parents might choose to give their children a different educational option. That's great. We actually believe and think it's a wonderful thing that kids are not a one-size-fits-all operation where you just plug them into a model and it will work for every kid. In fact, that's one of our problems with the government school system is often it treats kids like a cog in a machine. We're gonna treat every kid exactly the same and every family exactly the same and just hope it works out for everyone. And the numbers are showing that reality is showing it's not working out for everyone. So for some of our families, homeschool is going to be a better option for them. For some of our families sending their kids to a more established institutional type Christian school is going to be a better option for them. We are completely okay with that. We don't believe in a one-size-fits-all philosophy of education, but we do pray that all our families will see the value of what we're trying to do, which at its core really is to disciple the children of this church in the paideia of the Lord and to bear one another's burdens who are struggling to accomplish that, which often in Christian community, it's like, well, this is the right way thing to do, and if it doesn't work for you, that stinks, but it's the right thing to do. And we don't actually get in the grit of what can we do to bear one our burdens in this regard. We're trying to get into that grit. And I hope that all members, even if it's not for their family, will see the value of what we are trying to do. So if this is going to be successful, not only hope that they're supportive intellectually, but that the members of this church will commit to pray for the academy and to give of their time and finances as they feel led so it won't be every family that's partaking of it but just like any ministry in a local church it takes the whole church to be behind it even if that whole ministry isn't directed to particularly serving you right if you're a single guy in the church do you hope that the women of the church are being discipled well i hope so right that, that you're not the direct recipient of that necessarily but you are a member of the body and you want the body to be built up i hope our church would have that mindset as we consider um, this academy. So let me run through a few potential questions people might have and then open it up to you guys with any um, questions you've been thinking of as we've been going through this. The first is what grades will be, we be enrolling? And our intention is to open this up beginning with offering 
um, courses for K through 12 students, so the full range. And given the structure of our curriculum and classrooms, we believe that we will be able to facilitate all the grades in our academy, thus not excluding any of our families. Again, this is part of that one room schoolhouse mentality. You know, how is it that families with nine kids figure out to homeschool all their kids at the same time, right? They learn how to educate kids there at different places and they don't have this mindset of, we need a senior class, we need a sophomore class, we need a seventh grade class, right? If that's what we were trying to do, opening with K through 12 would be completely unrealistic, right? There's no way we could year one offer 13 classes that are going all year. But we might have one class that has like 15 kids, you know, the full range year one. And we think that is very reasonable, especially with the number of adults helping out throughout the day. So how large will the academy be? That goes to the second question. At this point, we don't know what that attendance um, will be. But that said, our goal is to keep this academy in the spirit of a one-room schoolhouse. Our goal is not to build a massive school, but rather build a multi-generational environment where, again, all these ages are learning together. Students across the grade spectrum will be learning aside one another. Brothers and sisters will spend much of their day together, okay? And this is where I think, again, this being a ministry of the local church, it keeps us grounded in our aspirations. Our goal is not necessarily to be the next largest school in town. Our goal is to minister to the families in our church as we're able, as much as we're able to extend beyond that reasonably and still keep oversight over it. We're glad to help with that. My prayer is that more and more academies like this are going to be popping up in local churches all over the place. I'm not trying to have a corner on the market here. We're praying that God would be raising up this sort of thing all over the place. There's another classical Christian school that Lord willing will open up in Ogden this upcoming year. I pray that that's successful. I've talked to them a lot in that and been pretty involved in helping them get that one off the ground. So I don't have a competition mindset whatsoever. I want to see more of these things raised up. And because of that, we don't need this to become massive. Well, obviously, if we're able to do it well and we can serve more people, we'll do that. But we're, we're going to have to scale that smart. If we, if we had aspirations year one of trying to take on like 80 kids, 100 kids, I think we would provide really poor education to the, all those kids and would burn ourselves out. That's not helpful for anyone. And so we have to be um, realistic about what we are actually trying to accomplish with this. What curriculum are we planning to use? Although we will certainly feel the freedom to use um, what we think is going to be best and not to be beholden to any one particular one, right now we're looking at using Memoria Press, which is a classical Christian curriculum. It's specifically not designed in packets to give kids all of what they need for their particular age or grade ranges, which again will work really well for this model. It's similar to like what homeschool families do. They buy curriculum for their particular child and they help them work through that throughout the year. Our mentality would be very similar, um, at least for most subjects, as we're helping the kids work through their curriculum. What would the schedule be? Our plan would be to meet full days Monday through Thursday. Um, we don't know the exact times for that yet, but this would be a four day a week academy. So it is not the same as like a half day once a week homeschool co-op. It is more full time than that. But in four full days, we really believe with it being rigorous and with it being highly instructed, that that would be more than sufficient educational time. Kids may have homework that are related to, for example, reading assignments, uh, but our plan is to fit the vast majority of their education within those four days. And one of the things you realize in homeschooling or just um, in different environments is you realize how much wasted time is in the average school day. There's a lot of time in transition. There's a lot of time doing things that aren't education. And if we were highly structured and paying attention, you can get a lot done in four days um, if it's rigorous, if it's pointing towards the end that we're hoping to accomplish, all right? So that would be the intended schedule for that. And our goal is to launch this in the upcoming school year of September, 2023. And uh, missed the point there that our intention would be to run this in a very typical calendar year of starting the Tuesday after Labor Day and ending the Friday before Memorial Day. That used to be like what every school did. 
and now they've made it confusing and every school district wants to do something different. I think that's a really easy way to lay out the calendar year. It worked for a really long time and then people got creative and tried to change it and it hasn't seemed to work. So that's an easy um, calendar year that we would run with. A couple more things. What will be the cost of tuition? Now, I, I would just say the honest answer to this is we don't know. But I also know that if you don't put any numbers down, people are like, well, that's great, but who knows? You know, it's just completely up in the air is not being helpful. And so please don't quote us hard and fast on these numbers. But we did want to give rough numbers to give people an idea of the cost we're shooting for with this. And I think these are reasonable estimates of what we are going for. And as we consider tuition for children involved, there's really going to be two main categories. The first will be the cost of curriculum and supplies, and the second will be the facility cost um, for the increased usage of the building. So although we're not able to quote exact cost, our goal is to keep the curriculum and supply cost around a thousand dollars or less per student. So this would include all of their curriculum that would come from Memoria Press, as well as all of the supplies that we would just be using, paper, pencils, tape, you know, all the sort of things that you need in a classroom that you use. Um, our goal is to keep it around that benchmark or less. I think depending on how fundraising and things go, we could actually make that less, but I think that's a, a really a realistic goal to shoot for at that about thousand dollar mark per student. As far as facilities costs go, we had intend to charge non-member families um, somewhere around four dollars per child and then cap that at a certain point so that if there is a family say that was sending six kids here it's not going to continue to go up and up with those kids. Um, it would cap at like a thousand so like for example you said four. Four dollars. 400, 400 per child and a thousand per household, yeah. So um, you that, said four dollars. Oh, that's pretty cheap. Yeah. That's a good deal. <laughs> we we're we're trying to make this affordable. Between four dollars and a thousand dollars. We'll turn on the heat yeah. once a year. <laughs> so, with this, the the goal is again to keep that as affordable as possible. So, and with that though, that's for non-member families. Our, part of how we want to run this particularly as a ministry of our local church is to cut that facility cost for families who are here, who are members of this church and who are giving. Because who is it that's paying the heat bill and the electricity bill here at our church? It's the members, ultimately. They're the ones who are paying for this. And so we wouldn't want to charge them on top of their facility fee. We're not like the federal government who taxes you when you buy a car and then taxes you when you buy gas and then taxes you when you register that car and then taxes you when you drive down the toll road, right? And it just finds 8,000 ways to tax you to drive your car. Our mentality is that the members are paying the bills of the church. We're not gonna make them pay the bills again, okay? So if they're paying the facility costs, all we would ask is that they honor a commitment to continue their normal giving to the church. We're, and we're not, again, setting a number on that. We're not saying you need to give X amount per year to the church or whatever percent. We're just asking between you and the Lord, part of our member covenant is that we'd give towards the ministries of the church. So if you're a member, we are gonna ask you to keep that member commitment that you made when you joined the church. And if that's the case, then we're gonna waive um, the overall um, facility cost for your family, all right? And so to put these numbers into perspective, if $1,000 per child roughly without a facility cost for members of our church sounds like a lot. Um, the government school system right now is spending about $15,000 per student per year. So this is an extreme fraction of what's being spent on public school and the average private school is charging about $8,111 per student per year. And so if a family who is a non-member had seven children, they could send all seven children to our school for the cost of sending one of their children to another private school, to put these numbers in perspective. It is a lot of money, but it's a fraction, and really there's no way we could possibly um, keep it much below that, all right? So that would be the rough cost, but with that, we would want to provide fundraising opportunities and scholarships for families to raise support for their overall tuition costs as much as possible. We already have some ideas of different fundraisers we could do for this. 
For example, every year, part of the old school, like obnoxious church calendar that had holidays like twice a week, one of those holidays in June was St. Boniface Day. And so it would be kind of fun on St. Boniface Day to hold a big fundraiser for the church, or for the school particularly. And I particularly think renting out one of those axe throwing places as part of that celebration would be awesome. Another thing we could do as a fundraiser for the school is legend has it that the tradition of bringing Christmas trees into your living room at Christmas time came from the tradition and history of Boniface cutting down that tree and now it being a symbol of worship for Christ. All right, so I think it'd be cool around Christmas time to sell live Christmas trees as a fundraiser for the school. So we could do really fun things tied to the mission of the school that I think would be um, really successful in helping bring down those costs for families. All right, so we'd want to keep it as low as possible. But what would be the expense for our church as we think of what would the impact be on this for our local body? As stated above, the church will plan to support this ministry by increasing our utilities and facility usage budget lines in order to support the school. The reality is if we have kiddos in here four days a week, our utility costs are just going to go up. That's, that's a reality. There's nothing we could do to avoid that. And so if we're going to be wise, we would plan for that increased usage. Now, some of this would be offset by non-member families who enroll, though them paying their facility fee, we would put that into the church's general fund to help pay for some of the increased facility costs that we would incur. But I think it's the right thing for us to do as a church as we look at upcoming fiscal years to plan for that increased usage. Now, with that being said, we are intentionally trying to set this up early on to be as strategic as possible in keeping our utility costs as low as possible. And what we're going to do for that is basically keep all the classes in this upstairs classroom down our classroom hallway up here. And the reason for that is that whole upstairs hallway what runs on one unit. Whereas, for example, the sanctuary and the back and the rooms below it, those are three different systems they're running. So if we use the basement right below us for the school, we'd have to be running three heat and air systems throughout the year. Whereas if we're only using the upstairs over there, we only got one unit running during the day um, while the school's going on. So we're gonna try to do things like that to keep it as cost effective as possible um, from a church utility standpoint. But ultimately, I genuinely believe that if God has given us this building for ministry, we should be using it for ministry as much as possible. We don't want to be wasteful with utilities, but if we're Scrooges with the utility bill because we're doing ministry in the church, what's the point in even having it? Why, why would God give us a building that we're going to complain about paying money to use for making disciples? That, that doesn't make sense to me. So in as much as we're able to afford it, um, I think we need to be willing to use this building for the sake of ministry, doing that in a wise way, doing that as much as the Lord enables us. But also, I think there is a real ministry opportunity here in that right now in Junction City and the surrounding area, there's not a single Christian school right now that's being offered to families. There's one Catholic school in town, and there's one like heretical kind of crazy school um, in town um, for an apostate church that holds a school out of theirs. But there's not one single Protestant Christian school here or in the surrounding towns. Um, I really think there's a huge need for that in the area. I wouldn't be surprised at all if the Lord used this in order to bring like-minded families into our fellowship in the future as well, um, which would certainly help with all these things. So that being said, um, for families who are interested in enrolling, right now what we're asking is that they just fill out a handout so we get an idea of what families are interested in being involved. Really, a lot of the specifics of how this is going to be executed is going to completely boil down to what families are like. We're really interested. We want to do it. And if we have three of those families, that's OK. We're going to start building logistics off those three families. If there's five families and they have these different skills, OK, we're going to use that in order to structure it going forward. Um, so really the next major step is just to figure out who all is interested in this um, and go from there as far as the plan um, that we're going to have to execute in pulling this off. So with that being said, I've talked a lot. I'm sure you guys have some questions. The answer might be I don't know, uh, but I certainly want to open it up to questions you guys might have. Or even just comments, feedback.
I don't know if you said this earlier, but uh, have you talked to other churches about this and see if they have input too, like other Baptist churches? Yes, um, I have. And so I was working pretty closely with the guys who are trying to start that, that other Christian school, um, some like-minded guys. One of the guys who's very involved in that, if you remember when John came and um, preached for me, John Hastings over at um, Vintage um, Church in Manhattan. So they're trying to start a, a Christian school as well. And really that where push came to shove um, with us, I think just kind of going in, in a little different directions, is they're wanting to have a more traditional um, Christian school that hires like full-time teachers and staff um, and that just comes with a lot of cost. And, and really my burden for that and considering that is I want what we're doing um, to serve the members of our body. I, I don't want to spend personally where I feel called um, a lot of my labors um, for the sake of something that's not going to serve our body. And so I do think in talking to our pastors, there is a need for this sort of thing um, in town. But we intentionally don't want it to be like a cross church work in the sense of we want it to be under the oversight of the pastors of this church, but I do think it is going to serve other churches in our community that have families that are desiring this sort of thing. So again, I think we're always going to primarily lean into families of our church um, for enrollment in this, but I do think we're going to pull in others as well um, in as much as we're able. Did I answer your question? Yeah. And we do have a handful of people that want to know more about mm -hmm. this that are not in our church. Yeah. Yes. We don't have school age kids, but it sounds like there's some things we could help with if we had time. Anything you're willing to I help mean, with. <laughs> I yes. like to make snacks. Yes. <laughs> no, and that's that's key and that's why we, we really emphasize that this school will fail if the church members don't get behind it. It really will. It needs to be, if we're going to say it's a ministry of our church, that has to actually be the case. Um, it can't just be, we're hosting it, but it's got its own separate thing that's running it. Um, we really want it to be a ministry of our body. And so as much as members can help in whatever ways they're gifted, if that means helping to plan for that fundraiser and prepare the meal and do some of those things. So that means giving their skills throughout the week and helping in school. If that means administrative help, there's all kinds of ways I mean, there's so many different parts of a school that make it function, especially when you're saying, and we're going to basically pay no one, <laughs> right? I mean, that's, it's going to take a lot of people raising their hands um, in order to volunteer their time. So yeah, there's tons of ways you can serve in it. And we will take all of them. <laughs> yes? Uh, maybe this is a dumb question. Are no. there Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So basically, in, in the state of Kansas, the way it works is, and this is very similar to like what homeschools are, is you have to register as like a non-accredited school. And that's the process we would do. And that's very similar. Like if you're a homeschool family, the state doesn't technically recognize you like as homeschoolers. They, text, they look at you as, oh, you're running a non-accredited private school. Um, and we would do the same sort of thing. Um, and we don't want to be credited by them. That's part of why we're doing this. <laughs> so. Anyone else have any questions? I'll throw one at you. Yeah. So you said, how hardlined are you on the kicking in and, and having skin in the game? Meaning, I love your first, one of your first things you mentioned was talking about the single mom. Mm -hmm. And so is there aspects of grace for circumstances? A hundred percent. And that's why it, what that looks like is not going to be the same for every, every family. But the mentality of like, I don't want to be involved. I just want someone else to run with it. That won't fly. But that could mean like that one person who had really on a weekly schedule would not be able to help much. But it's like during the summer fundraiser or something, they're going to lean in a lot. And so really, it's going to be particular to each family and what that looks like. But if someone had the mentality of like, I just want someone else to deal with it, that's, that would be the concern. Um, we want everyone to have skin in the game. 
that's substantial for them, right? Like the widow's mite was a lot of money, right? And, and so that, that's the illustration I would use for that and that they have to give what's a lot for them. That's gonna be different for every family though, what that actually looks like. Any other questions? I'll throw out another one. All right, hit me. So are you planning to make this a, an official um, stance of the church? Is this going to be um, decided on and, and ran at the pastoral level? Or is this going to be a church membership decision? Or? I think ultimately it's just at the pastoral level, just because it's a, a ministry of our local church. Like we, we never, you know, as, as much as we're a congregational church, when we decide to do a new men's study, we don't bring that to the church for oversight. And, and now that's, we, we as pastors are still leading the way on this. Ultimately, if the membership's not behind it, they can find a way to kill it, you know, if that's what they want. And ultimately, if the membership's not behind it, it just won't work. And so, but in as much as we're leading, we're, we're going forward and saying, this is what we're trying to do. And, you know, if the membership really wanted to sabotage it, I guess they could, but we have a lot of other problems if that happens, I think. I think so, Jessica has a question. Yes. Public school offers breakfast and lunch. Are we going to do that? And also, what about the parent who has to work 40 hours a week? How would they be able to volunteer their time to fulfill that obligation? As far as uh, breakfast and lunch goes, so the first question was, um, like in public school, kids often get um, breakfast and lunch for free. Um, we probably will not have the means in order to offer that sort of thing. Now, if a family needed help um, with food, um, I'm sure we could find ways to serve them as members of the body, just um, coming together to help with those sorts of things. But we're not gonna run like a full kitchen. That's not realistic, I think, for what we're trying to accomplish. But again, the whole heart behind this is we wanna bear one of our burdens. And so as much as that's a need from a family, we're gonna do whatever we can to help serve that need. Um, what's the second question? I forgot. How can a like how can a family that works both parents work forty hours a week how do yeah. they serve? Yeah, so so a family worked forty hour week. So similar to what um, Craig was asking, what does that look like um, for those who can't help during the week? I think it really is just a question of that person and us getting together and really considering what involvement can I have based on my time, based on my availability. Does that mean, you know, over the weekend, I'm helping to prep some of the supplies for the upcoming week um, and spend an hour printing off worksheets and helping get things prepped? Um, does that mean maybe I help with the fundraiser? I help um, do some of the back maintenance sort of um, accounting work? Does that mean, you know, all these different things that you can help out with that aren't necessarily in the classroom in the week? But our key will be we want every family to have skin in the game. And, and that needs to be particular to their situation that God has them in. But if a family just said, no, other people can figure that out. I just want to pay my check. Um, that wouldn't work. That, that makes sense? Yeah. That's Jessica, if you guys don't know. She's on FaceTime. Cool. Well, if you guys do have more questions, you certainly know where to find us. Um, I will lean in going back to the page about the things for this to be successful. The primary aspect of this for members um, is to pray. And I just ask you guys to join us in prayer for this. Um, that, that is by far the most helpful thing you can do. You ask about how can people serve? How can a single mom serve? Um, the number one thing she can do is commit to pray for it. Um, I probably should have answered that way initially but i just ask you guys really be praying about this praying that if it's the lord's will he would bless it and we pray your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven he has a will he has a kingdom those things are coming and sometimes as it pertains to his will we think one thinks his will and he teaches us otherwise through his providence and so we're just praying that god would direct this we think this is the direction he has us going and so we're walking um in that direction um but we ultimately just need the lord's hand of favor if this is going to work so I ask you guys to join me in prayer i'll just close with us praying um, and then we can hang out and go our way dear Heavenly father i just thank you so much for this church i thank you so much for the body of believers in this church 
Lord, we love the children that you've given to this body. Lord, I thank you for the rich blessing that the children of this body are. Lord, one of the most tangible signs that you have blessed and that you love this local church is that each Sunday when you cannot walk in a straight line without dodging children. Lord, I thank you for the children of this church, but we know that these children, these blessings that you've given us are also an incredible weighty responsibility that you've given us, that you've entrusted these children to us, and then you've given us the weighty task of nurturing them and training them and raising them up in the Lord. And Lord, I pray that you would help us by your spirit and through your word to raise up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That that would not be something that we simply put on a framed picture in our house, but that that would be something that is true of our house. Lord, would you help us to do this? And Lord, as I read a quote from a pastor recently that I so loved, he said, I don't want to raise my children to make a decision for Christ. I want to raise my children to make every decision for Christ. And Lord, I pray that the children of our church would be raised in such a way that they would make every decision for Christ that we would not just protect them from the onslaught of the enemy that would seek to deceive and corrupt our children, but that we would be preparing them to send them out and to shoot them out for the sake of your kingdom and your ministry here in this world. Lord, would you help us to be faithful in these things? Would you help us to walk by faith and not by sight? And Lord, I pray that you would use this endeavor in order to genuinely grow your kingdom here in Junction City and the surrounding area. So Lord, if it's your will, would you make it come to pass? And if not, would you show us the next way we should walk? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.